The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Drummond Capital Partners Proprietary Limited, ABN 15622-660-182, AFSL number CAR 0012600050 of AFSL 334906 and is limited to publicly available information. General advice may be provided by our sponsor, but does not take into account your objectives, financial situation or needs. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome to the XY Advisor podcast a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. Drummond Capital is an independent, institutional-grade investment manager passionate about supporting businesses with the implementation of managed accounts. While the growth in the sector has been significant, many businesses are not reaping the benefits. Understanding the journey and partnering with a truly independent business who is focused on achieving success for the advice practice is critical. Partnership is at the heart of what Drummond does, from investment management to client servicing and communications to business strategy support. Hello and welcome to this topic series about the 12 steps to implementing managed accounts into an advice business. My name is Fraser Jack and in this episode number two of four, we cover steps four, five and six in the change management process. In step four, we discuss having a strong value proposition and also investment philosophy. In step five, we think about what our clients really want. And in step six, we lean into the perceived objections from the point of view of all stakeholders. There is plenty to discuss in these three topics. So strap yourself in and take some notes on this episode. Now, Simone, we're talking about step four right now when we're talking about the value proposition and investment philosophy. And this is obviously a massive decision when it comes to um, a business plan and setting these things out and working out, uh, you know, who who do you want to be and what do you want to stand for? Talk us a little to us a little bit about your process that you went through um, when you set up the business or when you're having ongoing conversations about what your value proposition is to your clients and and, and how do you then um, or well, how did you come up with your investment philosophy as well? Yeah, sure. Um, so we bring the best ideas to our clients. So we help to demystify complex issues. So we feel that um, we we're acting as the head of a team of people that need to assist our clients to take action in all areas of their financial affairs. And they tend to neglect these areas because of lack of information or lack of time. So we we put ourselves at the head of that team of people that, that bring the best solutions to the client. So our investment philosophy is really consistent with other service areas that we offer. For example, on the estate planning side, we create the estate plan, we document it, we we highlight the issues and concerns, we flesh out the family tree, but we don't write the will. And it's very similar to what we do with our investment piece is we, um, you know, put ourselves at the head of the asset allocation discussion, the risk profile, the goals, um, what we're, what we're planning for, but then we don't, um, choose the underlying investments. So, um, that, that's sort of quite, um, that approach is quite consistent with all areas of advice that, that we look at for clients. Yeah. Okay. So that consistency, I think, is a is a really good thing as well. Like clients see you that uh, you're the you're there to help uh, provide them the the information on their journey um, and solve the problems. And as you said, demystify the complex issue. I love that uh, term. Um, bring in the best ideas. Um, as you were saying that, I was thinking of captain or coach of the team as you were, as you were talking. Yes. <laughs> and so that so t- tell us then uh, what how do you explain your investment philosophy to them? Like it's a like you're saying that, you know, you bring the good ideas, but what does the the business philosophy mean or the the business's investment philosophy mean to the client or how do you explain that to them? 
Sure. So the first part of that for us is it's really important that each client goes through an education process and gains an understanding of, you know, where they're coming from and also where we're coming from and some very important investment principles. And that's regardless of whether you're dealing with a very um, sophisticated, financially literate client or a client who's, you know, in the very early phases of their of their sort of wealth journey and tend to be a little bit younger. So we've got a, a, a quite a highly structured process that takes clients through that that um, conversation and that understanding. So we don't or we don't start with a managed account solution in mind. We might end with that, and that's really important for us in terms of delivering the right. Uh, outcome to the client um, and also making sure that the client file demonstrates a really sound compliance framework and that the advice is driven by the client with input from the advisor. So that process is the same for every client and then the end solution um, in terms of whether they're best suited to a MDA, an SMA or an industry fund, that that is the outcome. So each discussion is different. Um, but but we still have a set process for that. Yeah, that's really interesting. So um, the 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 process depending on the client. I just want to go back to one step: the education process you mentioned. How, how do you go through that? Is that something that you sit down with them and you have just conversational, or is that something that you, I don't know, test them on a little bit? Um, or are you looking for certain things or topics that they might be, you know, missing information yes. on? So it, it's quite structured and I think COVID helped us in a lot of respects with this because we developed a slide pack of about 45 different slides and what the advisor then does is tailor that. You know, there's some mandatory ones that we, we all need to go through, but then the rest of them can be tailored to, to where the client's at at that particular point in time. Um, so it was important to us that we have a consistent message across all the Annex Wealth Advisors. And so building that slide packet took us a lot of time, but we felt that it was important to make sure that the key messages are getting across. And then from there, we've developed a question set and we've integrated it into our risk profile questionnaire. So our risk profile questionnaire is sort of six pages long. There's a lot of space for free text for the advisor to write and then for the client to engage with that and add their comments uh, because we just feel that that's the only, by asking questions, it's the only way we can extract information from our clients rather than just us downloading all this information via the slide pack. It needs to be a two-way communication. Yeah, interesting. So um, so the, the, the question set then leads to what slides might not need to be need- to be yes. presented. And do you do that? Obviously, you probably wouldn't say we're going to do some education today. You would probably come in and say something like, um, you know, we just wanted to run through some of the things that we talk about a lot and make sure that you can understand them or what, yes, what, what's definitely. that? definitely. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. The clients are positioned at the start that it's not a, a first meeting to SOA presentation process. We, we certainly are looking um, to take clients on that journey. So we may have two or three meetings before we actually get to the point of positioning the advice um, and the engagement with the client. So they are aware of that upfront. And um, yeah, there, there's, there's certainly room for reflection coming back and, and, and looking at that. And we felt that was really important looking at the FASIA standards as just one, one example is how do we document that clients are understanding what it is that we're doing and and how we're going about it. So a, a bit of it came came from that. We're already naturally doing some of that, but then when reflecting on the FASIA standards, we felt it was important to take it to the next level and be able to document the client's understanding in terms of what we're asking them, but importantly, what they're saying to us. Yeah, and I guess that loops right back into the conversation around dem- demystifying complex issues when you mentioned mm-hmm. your, what you do as part of your value proposition. So, Yes. Dave, thanks for joining me again. We are talking about uh, value propositions and investment philosophies. Now, uh, these often come out of uh, history and experience and those sorts of things, and you've already mentioned that you went through a fairly traumatic experience at the beginning of your business career, um, uh, starting at a, at a peak and going straight into a GFC. Um, let's let's go into the investment philosophy and value proposition. How did you come up with that, and and where have you landed on those those things? Yeah, so look, we, we started probably five years ago. We had we had some deep um, thoughts around what we thought was appropriate, um, but partnering with our um, our MDA uh, licensee and you know several consultants. Um, and, and a few trusted uh, individuals in, in the professional advice space. 
we came up with um, an investment philosophy uh, that really resonated with our clients and we thought that could uh, stand the test of time. So we've always been massive advocates of strategic asset allocation. I think everyone within the financial planning space is. One thing though we did want to have was something um, where there was a tactical overlay, right, where clients could, through the uh, investment journey, have a process where they were risk on and risk off. Uh, so we built that into our mandates and, and that's been a, a process that's been completely invaluable and uh, what we've found is clients are more willing, even when there is turmoil, especially, especially around now and a couple of years ago, they're more likely um, to stick to the journey, which is the main uh, objective. Yeah, exactly right, and certainly stems out of the history of the business. Um, talk to me. Talk to me. In the last section, we talked around the idea of um, articulating, being able to articulate your investment flow uh, or anything that you do um, clearly. And so, I think this is a big thing that um, advisors have worked on a lot lately: is how do they articulate what their value proposition is, and how do they articulate what their investment philosophy is? Um, how, well, tell, talk us about that process for you, and how you went through it, and where you landed. Yeah, so we created three components uh, to our investment process, which was um, really robust strategic asset allocation. So getting the right modeling, the right data, and trying to um, map that out over a 10-year time frame. So put a lot of uh, inputs um, into that whole process. And as we all understand, that that's a big component that drives long-term returns and also risk as well. The other component is obviously uh, the tactical overlay, so having a dynamic process that actually allows us to um, go outside the strategic asset allocation, um, not only to uh, potentially cushion the downside, but also try to optimise the upside if possible. Um, the other component is obviously uh, manager selection. We use um, managed funds in, in our investment process. You can use direct uh, holdings, if, if that's what you prefer, but it, to our demographic, it's it's managed funds, and we obviously have a process around manager selection, and we've engaged NASA consultant that conducts all the manager visits and does that grunt work uh, for us, and and gives us key recommendations as to who we should include into our investment program. So they're the three key components that we landed on, but importantly, um, that's clear. Uh, and that's something that we can articulate to every single one of our clients. And everything that we do in the investment process, all our communication, all our timely insights um, that are event-driven, um, we can communicate um, to our clients to say, this is what's ultimately happened to you in this environment. This is where we see things going. It's not a generic um, bit of communication. And it's something that the clients really value. And it filters out all the noise in the marketplace at the moment. A lot of people read our stuff out there, but they can distinguish that what we're talking about is actually tailored to what is important to them. So that's a really important thing there. Each year, we obviously release our strategic asset allocation uh, paper where we update our figures uh, for the next you know, 10 years. And, that, and that's a big white paper that our clients um, really get a lot out of. And it's something we can continually speak to. Uh, it also allows our clients to focus on their medium to long-term goals. They are in a particular investment program for a key reason. We've got a 10-year lens. Let, let, let's keep our eye uh, on that objective. So all these things um, all communicate to each other, whereas in the past, you know, we were very reactionary. The inflation piece, we brought this up this time last year. The growth to value transition, you know, we implemented that, um, you know, roughly nine months ago to six months ago. So um, all these things that we kind of bring up, we then implement and the clients say, this is exactly what we spoke about. So this reactionary response just isn't existent um, at the moment. Yeah, wow, that's fantastic. So obviously that required developing a little bit of collateral, um, you know, around your around your north star, around what it is you stand for. But then exactly. also you just mentioned the uh, the the SAA paper, um, which looks at the, the, the a ten year into the future. So spot on. So it's something where um, we obviously try to see what the long-term return and risk expectations are um, across all our um, portfolios. Um, so a lot of work um, with our team is put into that 
Um, the, the process is extremely scientific. It's not something where people just plop or pluck uh, numbers out of nowhere. Um, there's a whole range of simulations and inputs that go into that. Um, there is also a bit of art um, to that process. It's not just purely science. Um, importantly, though, it's something where the work is done and um, we're really making informed um, investment decisions. Yeah, well, it certainly shows your clients that you stand for something and and, uh, and if you've got enough stuff in there that most of it comes true at some point, doesn't it? Well, that, that's right. And this is the other thing, uh, right? We obviously track our decisions. The, the transparency of all of this can be brutal, but uh, I guess that transparency and that honesty with our clients is really appreciated. But the track record at the moment uh, seems to be uh, we're running at about 65% of decisions are good ones. So I'll, I'll, I will take those odds. Hey, it, it's really interesting, isn't it, that um, that you lean into the concept that not every decision is going to be right. And when it's not right, you turn around and you say, Look, we, we, you know, th- this was, a, as you mentioned earlier, best idea. It was a good idea at the time. It's probably not a good yeah. idea anymore. But it's not something that you shy away from. You sort of lean into that concept and go, right, you know, we did get a whole lot right, but of course we're never going to get it all right. Exactly, spot on. And um, it's a humbling environment that we're in. So uh, I think the best thing is to be upfront about it. Mel, welcome back to the conversation. We are talking about uh, the the big chunky investment uh, philosophy. We're talking about value propositions. And and once we work out what the business is going to look like, we sort of need to start chunking down into what are we going to stand for? You know, what is the what is the value that we're going to provide to our clients and what is our investment philosophy going to be? I'm sure you've seen or had these conversations a million times with advisors. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this, this step actually can sometimes end up quite large. It can end up quite small. I, th- I think different people are on different journeys of how documented and defined their investment philosophy is. You know, I've, I've walked into advisor practices who give me the handout of the value proposition and investment philosophy and say, you know, we, we just want to replicate that with professional support versus people who are, you know, actually violently opposed to each other's opinion within the one practice. So it's Ooh. really interesting. <laughs> yeah. That's got to be tough, right, if a practice has different, completely different opinions. They do, and the especially the you know the staff that work there. It's it's more challenging for them. But again, you you've really got to tackle that head on and go. Well, are we going to have two different investment philosophies within the firm, or are we actually going to align? And, and you really need to know what this investment philosophy is. What do you believe? What do you stand for? And what do you want to give to your clients? What service do you want to provide them? And 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 on that investment philosophy, if somebody sort of is a little bit each way. What what do you what are your what are your suggestions around that? Because it kind of it, you kind of need to have a, str- a strong belief, don't you? Yeah, I think I think some people can be swayed. It's it's not the norm that I've seen. I think where you get more more of the challenges in this space is people want sometimes want someone to tell them what an ideal portfolio is, whether it's active, passive, whatever it is, whatever whatever the philosophy is. However, they want to be able to add and change little bits here and there because they think something or want a bit of cuteness over here that they want to add in. Um, it is rare that you have two completely opposing views within one firm, but we've had that. Um, but you do need to firm up your philosophy and you do need to work out what that client proposition looks like. And, uh, and like if you were sitting with somebody, if you sat down with a business, where, where do you start in that space? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's first question is, do you have a defined investment philosophy? And watch that conversation go from five minutes to an hour. Um, and then actually asking for information sometimes about what their portfolio looks like, because I think sometimes people, and again, a lot of this process, you've got to be really honest with yourself. I can have an investment philosophy in my you know, ideal kind of portfolios, et cetera, but every client looks wildly different because I've never kept to it because I keep changing my mind. And that's okay, but we just have to be, you know, clear about that. So just sitting down and going like, what do your portfolios look like now? Do you have a defined investment philosophy? Basic questions, active, passive, your involvement levels, all those kind of things, Um, you know, show me your SOA, what's in there? There's got to be something in these 100 pages we give out. (laughs) It certainly does. There's probably a lot in there. (laughs) Yeah. 
one of the one of the ideas around the investment philosophy that I like to lean into is the fact that it, it's a bias, right? It's a bias that the advisors, based on their experience, based on their beliefs, based on their the, the, their values, based on uh, you know fundamentals around you know um, looking at research and understanding how markets work and understanding yep. what has typically done well in the past, um, you know, although past performance. Yep. I think the idea that I that, that I find really in, embracing is that people lean into that bias and say to the clients, this is a bias I have based on my experience. I believe these things, um, not necessarily they are 100% true, but I believe in them. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. But I would also say that, um, you know, within the process of managed accounts and professional investment management, those beliefs can change. You don't have to be wed to a belief that you had. You know, I think we often get wed to this belief we have and we're too scared to change it, but you can broaden what that view is, change it, add it and mix it. So, um, you know, with professional input, your investment philosophy and your beliefs might change a little bit. Your views of the world right now might change a little bit. You know, you, you might not have previously thought markets were volatile enough to generate huge alpha in certain spaces. Now you might think they do and that's okay. Yeah, exactly right. And now, that, so so the investment philosophy is one thing, but that we just um, sort of skipped over, and I'll come come back to it. The value proposition side of this, and the value proposition around where do I add the most value to my client, it sort of is that concept of maybe a, maybe my role is not as the investment advisor. Yeah, but then what is your role, um, and what and what do the clients value, and then looking at okay because often it's really interesting because sometimes you'll go into a practice and you know they're great because everyone's really open it's really collaborative but you're like you know what is your value proposition but then how much are you actually getting to do that so a value proposition versus what they're actually doing can be really different as well so the value proposition a lot of the time doesn't change too much because they're not doing it right now so uh, why, why would that be is that because they just have too much else going on or are they actually just maybe they don't believe don't believe in their value proposition or they don't believe there's enough value in it? I think capacity, systems, processes, tech, compulsion to change to get to there and just knowing as well that it can be done or achieved better than they're doing it right now um, but just not having the ability or the capacity and time to get to it. What what are you seeing with when you know some great practices that you work with with their value proposition that they can clearly articulate what sort of value they bring to their clients? Do you know what I mean? It's segmentation is one thing. So when I see a well defined value proposition, they're clearly defining not what you give to the client, but what the client receives from you. So it's done in the client lens. So you will get X Y Z from me, or you will feel X Y Z from me. This is how I'm going to deliver it to you. These are your different options. So it's, it's, it's the client's view instead of the advisor's view. And then behind a good value, value proposition is very clearly defined. In, in my experience is very clearly defined segmentation. There's not much scope creep between the segmentation because that's how you can be. A lot of clients won't mind too much. If you say, I'm going to give you X, Y, Z, this is how much it is. You know, you said you wanted blah, blah, blah. This is how I'm going to give it to you. That's fine. But as soon as you stop doing that, that's when you get the friction. Um, but if you start creeping up in scope as well, you're taking from someone else. So you've got to have those really clear defined segmentations and what the value is of each of those services. And then the only other tip I would say value proposition, um, be you've got to be really unbiased in what you think the clients actually want. And yeah. that's challenging. How do you mean, like how do you mean by that? So, I mean, I think you could ask probably, mo well, you would know best. I mean, everyone I'm sure would say to you what the value proposition is around, you know, clients want communication, they want easy to understand documents, what do they want? But everyone's probably got a very similar list of that and that's not necessarily your value proposition. No, I 100% I agree and I really love the, the way that you mentioned the client, putting it in the client words, making the client the hero of that journey. It's not about what you're giving, it's about what they're receiving and the perception of what they're receiving and, and what they value. So, um, uh, yeah, I always say to people, you know, ask your client, what was the benefit of that? What was the emotional benefit from from uncertainty to certainty from, you know, like what what are the intangibles inside of that value proposition That's that you can, put it. you can you can you um, can you know, take them from, you know, we're doing this, but we're taking a complex structure and we're turning it into, into simple terms or that's 
that's what mm. people value about us. You know, it's it's not about what we're offering. It's about what they their interpretation of what they receive. And are we making them feel more certain or less certain in the way we're interacting with them, right? I mean, yep. I know I feel more uncertain about a situation when someone I deem as an expert is talking to me in a way I don't understand. Yeah. And you mentioned clearly defined, um, see, like clearly defined role, clearly defined segmentation, which I think is great too, because it's, you know, it, you know, anything that, as we said before, anything that's sort of confusing is just uh, really hard to make decisions. Yeah, it's hard internally and it's hard because it does, you, you give more to one client and there's often a lot of practices who say the top end props up the lower end. And I just think that's thinking we really need to challenge. Tom, welcome to this step four of our process or change management process. Uh, talk to us a little bit about step four. We're talking about uh, investment philosophies and, and, and value propositions. I bet you've had many, many conversations with many people about what uh, their investment philosophy could be. Um, tell us a little bit about those conversations. It's interesting. I think there's probably a lack of understanding about what a, a true investment philosophy is potentially in the market. Uh, and I think... <laughs> Again, early stages of the managed account journey for a lot of people. There's a lot of uh, consultants out there that deliver the value through trying to help an advice practice articulate what an investment philosophy is. But a philosophy is one thing and, and a holistic investment service is another. Um, some observations around the Australian market. I think there's been certainly a, a somewhat of a cult of value for a period of time due to some you know, large sort of movie star fund managers that have potentially indoctrinated advisors. I'm not sure that the rest of it is necessarily grounded in their, their strong belief, but really what, what we're trying to achieve here is get clients and advisors to essentially refocus themselves back on you know, asset allocation. That's what we do as a business. We're asset allocation you know, experts and specialists. And, and really what we're trying to do is have you know, the client ultimately is trying to achieve long-term objectives and it does so through a diversified portfolio that their advisor aligns with them. And if we get back to the basics that asset allocation but is the primary driver of returns over the long term, uh, then really it becomes less about, you know, the nuance in the philosophy and whether that means you low cost, you know, passive versus active or value versus growth or um, it, it really comes back to what is the best, um, you know, por growth portfolio or balance portfolio I can build for my clients. But but more broadly, a managed account you know, as a service should enhance engagement. It's a transparent structure. Um, I should be looking for you know strong reporting, strong client engagement, uh, and and everything that comes with that service, not just you know the investment outcome necessarily. And so, really, what we find is unfortunately a lot of advisors or advice practices have gone back to the beginning and are really trying to recreate um, a service from the ground up. And unfortunately, it takes a lot of time and a lot of resources to build a true investment philosophy and process and the systems that go with that. Uh, and then all of the regular reporting and insights around that. And so, uh, unfortunately, you know, there, there are different ways to do this, right? You can you can go to market and adopt somebody else's, and I think absolutely that's fine. And certainly the clients that work with us come along and say, well, you've really thought about this. You've thought about a, a way in which we can deliver a holistic service and actually want to adopt our philosophy so they can get back to, again, focusing on what they're good at and, and what, really what their clients want in, in delivering the, the technical and ongoing service and advice. Yeah, I find this is one that uh, advisors struggle with a little bit because um, often uh, can get down deep into the weeds when it comes to investment philosophy and get a bit too a bit too tactical in that scenario versus the higher level strategic idea of what that might be. And, and to have that, I guess, or to start with that larger umbrella of what that, you know, the philosophy could be in, in, in a, in a, in a chunked up bigger picture view um, without getting too stuck into the weeds. Do you find that sort of a, there's a whole level hierarchy there or different where people just dive from one to the other? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, look, partly it comes back from the, it's a bit of confusion, like what is the investment philosophy? I think because of the traditional advice process has been driven around a, ultimately a sales process in a way, like if you have an idea whether that's to change a fund or an asset class, it's usually driven, you have to sell that idea to your clients to get them uh, to adopt. And I think over time in Australia, you know, a lot of the solutions have been provided by, you know, traditional research houses, which are sort of bottom up fund research houses. Uh, there's a cult of the movie star fund manager, and we've seen the downfall of one of the, the biggest ones of the, recently. And so advisors have sort of, in a way, 
their investment philosophy has been around picking the best manager and, you know, really backing them and standing behind it. And I think, unfortunately, it's sort of the portfolio construction and the asset allocation piece has sort of been not forgotten, but it's been pushed to one side over time. And again, back to managed accounts, if, if we do believe, as the research suggests, that asset allocation is the primary driver of returns, then actually getting away, the, the beauty of a managed account um, is it's a holistic portfolio and we can get away from that sales process around we've got to buy the next movie star fund manager and get back to you know, what are your long-term goals and objectives and what is the best portfolio to give you the best chance of achieving that. And and I think that's really changed the game for a lot of our clients and means that they're away from that sales process, less focused on the line item and getting their clients to essentially focus back on, you know, the objectives and the outcomes of the portfolio. And that's really what's most important. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. They're, the um, they're, and, and sometimes the philosophy does include some emotional aspects or some beliefs or some uh, some past experience um, as, as we all have been through certain parts of the market ups and downs. So I think yeah. it, it's difficult to sometimes sit back and, um, you know, let your emotions uh, to one side for a little bit and just look at the, the numbers and then work out what a good philosophy would be from a practical, logical point of view. Uh, Tom, thanks so much for, for coming on uh, this particular point. We look forward to catching you when we take, dive into step five. Okay. Simone, thanks for joining us again in step five where we're talking about cl- the client and uh, specifically what, you know, clients want out of a, an advice relationship. Um, tell us, what do your clients want? Okay. Um, we feel that clients want outcomes. So that they're obviously looking at the bottom line and what outcome that they are getting, but they also want the truth and, and transparency. So we believe that, that we provide that to them, but they want us, they want their advisor, we believe, to be focused on strategy and also focused on the relationship. So when it comes to what we can do for them, we believe that they're expecting us to do the research in terms of what is the best, as I mentioned before, the best ideas that are available. They have an expectation that we do the research around that and then bring to them what are the best outcomes available in the marketplace. So our clients are time poor and don't have the ability or the knowledge to do that for themselves. So they're expecting us to do that across all facets of, of the advice process. That's really interesting. Now, I really like the idea of best uh, ideas too. You mentioned that when we talked about value proposition, but um, best ideas doesn't mean best investment or best um, risk policy or best, it's best ideas. It's uh, mm. it's certainly, it sort of takes the pressure off a little bit, doesn't it? It does, but that also changes over time. So I think speaking to other advisors around transitioning to managed accounts as an example, we can sometimes get bogged down in, but I can't go out with that story now because five years ago I told my client that, you know, the multi-manager approach or this was the passive investing, that was the way to go. But I think clients are expecting us to evolve as things evolve. So as technology evolves, as products are innovated, they're expecting us to be really on top of that as well as on top of the strategies and the changes and the government legislation. Um, so I think that that should just become a part of a normal conversation with the client that here we are, again, there's a new, there's a change, there's something that's that's happened, that's evolved, and, and let's talk about that and whether that might be suitable for you. Yeah, but so best ideas based on current conditions, not yes. uh, not some promise you made six years ago. Yes, exactly right. And staying staying true to that and, 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 and holding on to that is, is doing the wrong thing by the client because you know, if we do that, it becomes almost an ego for me. It becomes an ego thing that I need to attach myself to this because that's what I, you know, I associated myself to that. So I think just just removing that and understanding that that things change and 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 things happen. I think that's giving the client what they would expect. Yeah, certainly, certainly leaning into that concept of we can't predict the future, and sometimes the 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 best ideas will be wrong. Mm, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, really exactly. good, really good. And uh, and as you mentioned before, relationship, you know, is a, is a huge part of this, you know, truth, um, transparency and trust. So it's a, it really is that uh, long-term, as you mentioned um, earlier, that really that long-term relationship that you're, you're looking for. And I guess that's what the, you look, and if that's what you're looking for, you're finding clients that want that too. Definitely. That's right. Dave, thanks for joining us again. Uh, we're in the process of having a chat about what clients want or or get out of a process. Um, we've been through your process. You've got some pretty great collateral that you can talk to your clients about. Uh, but apart from the collateral, tell us what else your clients get or want out of their, uh, their relationship with their advisor. Yeah, so 
obviously the investment piece is being taken care of and we can communicate that um, extremely well. If for whatever reason our client is off track, we've got actually the time to do the strategic things. And that's where we see advice really playing an important role. And obviously, a lot of people see that as well. We spend more time on the strategic piece, doing things that we can make a real tangible benefit to our clients whilst the investment piece is running in the background. Of course, the client really wants us to understand that and have a good grasp of that. And they want to feel connected to that. Um, but the efficiencies, um, engaging the right professionals really does free up our time. We're spending less time doing things where we'll struggle to add value and focus on the areas where we can add value. Um, so that's been really important for our clients and, and we feel it is hard to quantify in, in a lot of uh, – we operate in the dark arts a little bit. Um, so it, it is um, – trying to create tangible value to our clients can be difficult to articulate sometimes, but having um, greater conversations around what's important to them has really been a big part of, um, I guess, our continued success. Yeah, exactly right. I love, I love the idea of creation, uh, creating intangible value um, more so than just tangible value. And I really like also what you said around um, our clients want a connection to something, you know, uh, and I think that's that connection is certainly done on a human to human um, a intangible level. Yep, spot on. Um, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, you mentioned transparency. Hey, do you ever get in conversations with clients around that just want uh, – um, low fees or um, all those sorts of things? We do. Um, I think everyone does. Uh, so it's not for everyone. Let's let's be clear. Um, so we do have solutions for someone that is extremely low or cost conscious. Um, we do have solutions for that as well. And you can run managed accounts in a very low cost environment if that's um, what you want to do. Um, so that is something we are thinking about. Uh, potentially having a solution um, for that space. Um, but in the meantime, you know, we do advise on there's qu plenty of quality solutions out there for um, cost effective portfolios. Um, and if clients don't want to engage us in a more larger investment piece, then, you know, that, that's fine. Uh, so be it. In, in saying that, though, the beauty of the managed account space is uh, that transparency. And when our asset consultant um, is able to negotiate a fee rebate that does go back into their account and they see that hit their account. Uh, so that they, they love that and they know that um, when we are engaging a fund manager, we are trying to get the best possible outcome net of costs for them. Um, so in our typical um, investment program that might have, you know, 15 or so um, to 20 uh, managed funds, Roughly 12 at the moment would have some kind of rebate negotiated with them. Um, part of our investment process is to include um, some index options as well. So we're not 100% purely active. We do adopt a bit of a core satellite approach as well. Mel, thanks for joining me again. We are talking about the client experience and what clients really want. We sort of touched on this in the previous chat where we talked about the value proposition. But uh, t tell me what you're seeing in, in regards to when you speak to advisors about what their clients want from the relationship. I think um, just in the last few years, I think advisors have ended up challenging themselves in a COVID time about what clients want. So I think this is really a very interesting space to be in in the last six to 12 months because I think this is changing. I, um, my experience has been advisors are breaking their own perceptions about what clients want. I think the ones that I'm seeing doing this really well are instead of focusing on the medium or the delivery, you know, or the delivery method and what they're delivering is kind of what we spoke about in the last episode is how does that make the client feel? So does the client want on-demand updates on the market because they're feeling uncertain with the swings? Um, do Does the client want to keep a level of control with constant, you know, portfolio updates or the perception of constant updates? Like what, what are we trying to achieve with the, our client communication? And do they want you as an investment manager um, or, or do they want you managing and being the governance across all of their affairs? Yeah, it's really interesting there because um, you know when clients want communication, is there a, is there a obviously asking them is the number one and working out for them what's what's good for them. But is there a, you know can you over communicate to clients? Can you give them too much? 
Yeah, I've seen I've seen firms. Who, there's actually an amazing firm I worked with, and the most incredible marketing and communication kind of framework set up, but almost just went a little bit too far that it almost became spam, <laughs> right? Um, and an amazing segmentation exercise for them was bringing it back, and they actually ended up with personalized phone calls as part of the segmentation the internal segmentation offering. And it wasn't the client gets to call you twice a year. They had tasks to call the client. Just check in. Hi, how's everything going? This is what's been happening. Just hi. Like what a nice touch. Um, but I definitely think you can go too far. Um, they brought the pendulum back really quickly and then added in some very personalized touches in there, wheeled back the, the high marketing and that got amazing results as well. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? The, uh, there's there's communication and regular and constant that you're going to turn up when you say you're going to turn up. Um, but yeah, personalizing it has always been, I guess personalizing things at scale has always been really tough. Yeah, agree. And I think that's one of the, and we'll talk about it later, one of the benefits of managed accounts, right? And it's a collation of best ideas in a portfolio and a best ideas portfolio for one person could be the same best ideas for another person. So the personalization touch, it's not as high, sorry, it's not as high touch as it used to be to provide professionalized service when you have that uniformity in other parts of your business. Yep. And that, how important is, we mentioned technology before, how important is technology in that space of being able to look after clients? I don't think you can do it without technology. Like you just, I, I'm yet to see it done without a high adoption of technology and consistent adoption of technology. So, you know, every, you know, you ha- if you're going to adopt one process or system and one software, you've got to fully adopt. There's no point being on two for the same thing. It's worse. Yep. And, and have you, have, is there anything that you've seen that uh, advisors doing really well in that space of and getting in clients to really engage with their portfolios and really engage with their advice? Yeah, there's so much work coming out recently um, for client engagement, front end, digital fact finding, and all of the client goal settings, client portals, beautiful things for the clients to interact with and for advisors to get that information in a very quick and, um, and, and in a way that feeds straight into their data systems. So for me, there's just no kind of excuse anymore for not having a process like that. The, the text there, it works. It's great. Um, can be scary to try and get into it. Um, but it, that, that's our own biases. Again, it's, it's very easy with amazing companies out there who will literally handhold you through the way. Tom, we are chatting about step five in the change management process. We really are focusing on clients and what clients want. Uh, tell us about your experience in this and what you think uh, you've or you've spoken to advisors about uh, what clients really want out of their uh, relationship with the advisor. In the end, I don't think they're looking to you to pick the next, you know, Facebook or Amazon or the next big winner. They want to trust you. They, they trust you. They want to get the information from you. They want the communication. They want the engagement. They want you to be there and, and help them sleep at night and not worry about their money. It's really that simple. And the, the advisor, you know, client relationship is embedded in that that trust. And so um, I think that in itself is really important to these considerations. Yeah, now you mentioned um, obviously trust is a huge factor and it takes some, it can take time to build trust, but obviously once it's built, it can be a very, very strong uh, emotion that people have w- with their relationship that they have with their advisor. And, you know, you talk to um, the stats show that, you know, most clients or all clients trust their advisors. Um, and obviously because the relationship has been built. Um, t- talk to me about that from a, you, you mentioned sort of communication being a big part of that. What sort of things are we talking about when it comes to communication with clients and in, in ongoing communication or regular communication, not just having the sort of once a year meeting? Yeah, I think, you know, when we, when we talk to our clients about adopting, you know, our service at least in terms of investments, they're, they're worried essentially that uh, the, the client's going to, you know, think less essentially of them for outsourcing some of the investment, you know, communication, if, if you will. And again, one of the powers of managed accounts is actually to enhance that communication. So the, the clients generally now have a nice app on their phone and they can see all the decisions and, you know, the activity in real time. And so 
you know, we work to we, we produce l- large amount of regular communication, and our clients, in turn, sort of through our white label solution, will provide that to to their clients. And what we're finding is they're having deeper, more richer conversations with their clients on an ongoing basis. Again, because it's coming back to that sort of holistic goal, the portfolio, um, the asset allocation, uh, and and how that's aligning with their long term, you know, objectives. And so. So helping the advisors to set the narrative and helping them to have more regular and consistent communications is actually enhancing um, the relationship. Nowadays, we live in the information age and everyone expects to hear from you know, their service providers on a more regular basis, like having a quarterly review and then not hearing anything in between that quarterly review uh, is no longer good enough. And particularly as we get towards engaging the next generation who are used, you know, they want to receive weekly communications, not monthly communications. And so, you know, one of the real powers of the managed account service is that your clients have got consistent portfolio outcomes means that you can actually provide more regular and consistent communication you know, alleviating the burden to need to go and do that yourself, but also feeling the need that, you know, and the expectation, I guess, that, that everyone's got. Yeah, I certainly think um, from an from an advisor sitting there um, thinking about how can they communicate regularly with their clients on this aspect, I'm, I'm certainly thinking there's plenty of opportunities for them to record something and send it out to all, all uh, especially if I've got a lot of clients aligned uh, in this space, but also... Um, also, I think a lot of that trust factor that you mentioned comes through in the belief that the advisor um, knows or understands everything as well and the belief that the advisor is completely 100% on board with everything that's going on. And I guess that comes back from some of the previous conversations we had around um, around value proposition. What, what are your thoughts around the advisors and, and their belief and trust in, in, the, in the process as well? Again, come this this whole concept of building your own or partnering with somebody else, I think, is really important consideration on communication. If you want to start from scratch, adopt, you know, develop your own investment philosophy, develop your own investment service, then ultimately you're going to be responsible for producing all of the communication. If if the objective of building your own or having a managed account solution within your business is to gain the efficiency and have more time to spend with your clients or finding clients, then you're not really alleviating any burden for yourself. So when you are sitting back and assessing what is it that I'm trying to achieve from this, then look look towards the partner that you're going towards or in our case outsourcing and saying actually you've got a holistic end-to-end service that's got really deep rich communication. That's actually going to give me the efficiency but also the increased engagement that I want. And so I think when you are think starting out on this journey, and look towards where you're trying to get to. If the communication and service is really important, and I think it should be for all all um, advisors to consider, then you know, do you want to be responsible for you know producing uh, all of that content yourself, or do you want to leverage uh, the content that your you know your investment partner can provide? Yeah, I guess one of the things when we talk about clients and trust, um, one of the big things that could could uh, could harm that is anything to do with shock um, when it comes to expectations or fees or anything or anything around that. Anything around the uh, uh, you know we, we were doing something and now it's something completely different or it's more than they expected. Um, talk, tell us a little bit about that. What your thoughts are around sort of that that shock around fees or shock around uh, expectations or. Un- Certainly, I think you know the way that the service is positioned is just an extension of what most have already been doing, but comes with additional features and benefits for the client. And so, it's really around evolution, not revolution. That's the first thing we sort of say to advisors: it's, you need to take your clients on a journey, but ultimately, you still got the same process, and you're really aligned to the same outcomes. You're just delivering it in a different structure. Um, But fees, as we know, we live in Australia and the industry super funds do a great job of keeping clients focused on fees and um, certainly versus other markets in the world, there's a a much stronger focus on fees and the value chain has evolved and and really what we're seeing is um, the need to provide fee certainty. Advisors we know each year need to produce a fee disclosure statement for their clients, articulating all the fees and costs in involved in, in delivering the advice to them and so you know, one of the things that should be considered and that we try and deliver on is you know that fee certainty so having some sort of fee budget or fee cap as part of the process means that next year when the FDS is produced uh, there's not nasty surprises as, as you say Fraser and, and that they have that certainty. The other real ability is, is leveraging kind of institutional scale an advisor at a single practice level uh, is unable to go out in a lot of instances and negotiate on mass to to achieve you know institutional pricing. So again, you know, partnering 
with groups such as us where we can leverage our collective scale, we're able to go to market and get um, you know, competitive um, fee deals, which you know benefits the client directly, and and so you know, providing that fee certainty and transparency plus the scale advantages is um is you know one of the real benefits of Managed Account. Now, Tom, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is obviously because you've been an advisor and you spend a lot of time having conversations, uh, joint conversations, I guess, with advisors directly to clients. Do you think that's something that uh, your history of being an advisor helps you being able to relate to that, uh, what the clients are trying to get out of a conversation with an advisor? Absolutely. I mean, I've sat in the chair and had the had the conversation directly with clients for many years and also been involved on selecting funds and researching funds uh, as part of that journey. And again, you know, observations of the industry was that the, the sort of communication that fund managers provide to advisors often is it's late, it's in the rear view mirror, um, it's not very detailed and it's not very transparent. And so we're, you know, we see our clients as, as partners and an extension of their business. And so, you know, what we're trying to provide is that transparency, that support um, and, and insights which are digestible, not only to the advisor, but to the end client. I think that's really important. So thanks for joining us to chat about uh, step six in our change management process. Uh, we really are leaning into the concept here of um, there's always a, a, a what if, you know, but how about this or an objection or um, uh, uh, what I tend to call a limiting belief in our mind somewhere. Mm-hmm. Whenever we make a decision, there's always a, some learned behavior that we've learned from somewhere. We picked up something and we're uh, and we and we go, oh, yeah, but what about that? In adopting this process or, or any process for that matter, whether it be, um, you know, the going to a new license or managed accounts. Talk to us about some of the things that have come up with you, with the advisors you work with, um, any any ideas around, uh, not, not so much object, objections, but things that popped up in, in, in conversation. Yeah, sure. I think for us, control was an element of concern when adopting the managed account. When we moved from our previously uh, run managed account, it was really important to us that we had control to hire and fire the portfolio manager. So we're not interested in a short-term relationship with the portfolio manager and the portfolio manager that we've appointed is Drummond Capital. And we're looking forward to a really long and you know prosperous partnership with them. But it was really important for us to have that sense of control in that we can make that change if we want to. So when we started our own AFSL, we had the choice of being appointed as the operator of the of an Alvin MDA and then you need to have an extra condition put into your license. So we had that choice to make and then obviously we had a choice to make around appointing the portfolio manager. So we decided to not um, be the MDA operator. So we solved this by appointing an MDA operator, which is Philo Capital. So they provide the MDA licensing. So our initial concern over control complexity was solved by appointing an MDA operator who provides us with the licensing. So they also monitor the portfolio manager, collect fees, pay the portfolio manager, et cetera, and, and give us a lot of ongoing advice and support. Yeah, interesting. So, uh, you know, in just uh, just on top of that, we'll probably get to a bit more of that later on in the conversation, but um, MDA uh, operator, you also, um, SMA is also something that you offer just for some clients. So you d- depending on the client, you'll choose which one? Yes, definitely. And that certainly flows out of the question set that we have developed. So where that client might be best suited is fleshed out through that process. So we certainly, certainly not jumping to an MDA, but, but we have a full range of managed account offerings. Yep. So control was a big one for you. Were there anything, were there any others that you sort of thought might be the case? Um, obviously you're, uh, you run your own license now was, and, and a lot of that was taken into consideration when you, you know, uh, as a responsible manager. Yes, definitely, definitely. So the risk management was certainly a big part of it. We don't want advisors building their own portfolios because of the inherent risk associated with that. So that was a big part. Um, from the advisor's perspective, there's always seems to be concern for advisors when they're putting in front of clients a more expensive solution. There's been a bit of a feeling that if I'm offering a more expensive solution, that that somehow I can't do that, that that's somehow written into legislation that clients are not permitted to go into more expensive um, products or, or investment services. And that's certainly not the case. So we had to do a bit of work at uh, looking at that ourselves internally and just uncut what was behind that, where where that concern was coming from. And a fair bit of it obviously was from the environments that we'd all been in before with the with the compliance 
regimes that we'd been part of. And just, you know, we, we solve that by making sure that we have a um, customised, tailored experience for every client and, and by making sure that that is clearly documented and articulated. So we push through that. Yeah, so the, the focus on cost has obviously part of big, you know, been a big part of a, a lot of marketing campaigns over a long period of time um, and still gets, you know, consumers to think that cost is the be-all and end-all um, of investing. Does that mean that if if somebody is of that or clients are of that belief, then obviously you have solutions for that, as you mentioned earlier? Yes, we do. Certainly, yeah. certainly we do. If that's if that is the overriding factor, um, we do have solutions that that suit that. But it, it, for us, it comes back to the transparency uh, point in that once you, I suppose, open up the box and clearly lay everything out item by item by item. It is that ability for the client to see that transparency. And when you do take that and compare it to their current solution or other solutions that are available, it actually becomes a lot clearer. But but being able to break that down and understand it is is a bit of a skill that advisors had to had to get comfortable with. Yep. And and sometimes when making decisions like this or or any decision in the business, there's often a lot of choices around, mm. and um and you know the fear of making the wrong choice can often hold people back. Yep, certainly. So you've got control, and you mentioned before that you 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 know getting rid of a, any 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 contractual obligation to stay with that person and to have the the idea of hire and fire. How important is that flexibility? It's of utmost importance, as as I was saying, if we feel it's important from the client's perspective, but but also just just really important for us to be in control of our own business. We're not um, looking for sort of short term outcomes. We want to partner with a portfolio manager for the long term, similar to the message that we give our clients. But but just to have that control was was vital. Welcome back to the conversation, Dave. Thank you. Now we are talking about objections and the concept of there's always a yeah but moment whenever we whenever we hear of a new thing. Um, there's always a oh is is it new? Is it why why should I go there? There's always this little thing in the back of our brains that sort of triggers up something. When uh, when you were going through this process of you know transitioning your business across, what what were your objections? Yeah, why are we introducing this, <laughs> right? And um, I think. That's where the collateral is really important uh, and that's why we developed um, our document called the Portfolio Project. It ga- really gave the context and the background as to why we were implementing this change. Um, at the time, we didn't have any track record, right? So that was um, quite uh, difficult at the time but now we do and it's clear as day as to why we're, we're on this journey and why we're implementing what we're implementing. Um, but at the time, yeah, we just had to give the context as to why we're going down this path. We didn't know a pandemic was coming and um, we we're just fortunate that we got uh, in there before it all did. Yeah, that's a really interesting one, isn't it? Not uh, the, 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 No track record. I guess it's um, it's always the sort of thing in the back of somebody's mind whenever they're, when, when they're about to start something because they have to turn up to their clients and say, this is our beliefs, this is what we believe in, uh, and we're going to hang our, hang our, you know, our, our logo on it or our brand on it. Um, and yet the, if people say, show me the returns, you're like, uh, we, ha- we haven't got anything. So how did you get around that? It was interesting. We, 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 had, we actually had to provide uh, some kind of pseudo-style portfolios just to kind of give a, a bit of an idea and the flavor of what we're trying to do. And a lot of the underlying investments that we were recommending had existing track records. So we were able to articulate um, that relatively cl- uh, clearly. And we did explain up front, we are building the track record, but part of our story was we wanted to introduce more transparency and more, I guess, a way of being able to understand whether our investment process was actually adding value to our clients. So we said that would be a journey and we would build that, but that was something that our clients would go on with us. Now, at the time you were um, self-licensed, did you have any concerns around licensing and whether... um that was an issue for you guys at the time? Yeah, so our license, we, we didn't have uh, an MDA uh, capability within our um, licensing. So what we did was pro- uh, engage um, a third-party MDA licensee. Uh, it's not just a licensee, though. Um, uh, I'll mention the name Philo Capital. They, they are genuine specialists um, in what they do um, in terms of 
Um, they track all the mandates. They give us updated reports. If anything was operating outside of it, they are onto it. All the transactions are implemented extremely efficiently um, and with a real process. So it wasn't just um, someone watching and ensuring that you got best in- interest duty um, at heart, but also someone that was a real expert in implementing um, uh, these portfolios. So that was something I didn't quite understand as to what the role was at the start, but going through that now uh, and seeing several um, stressed markets uh, in that process, um, they are genuine um, experts in what they do. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned the concept um, before around uh, uh, around you know like if you start this you, you once you start a new process you've you know that's it you might be locked in for a long period of time. How did you how did what were your thoughts around that and how did you feel around the concept of say being locked in to manage accounts? Yeah, so it, it was look we did create it in a way where we did we do have flexibility. It's more the unwinding of a relationship that that's hard. So, not to compare it to breaking up with a partner or something, but it's more. We, we, that, that was part of the reason um, we loved um, the structure so much. Is that if for whatever reason you um, your asset consultant isn't um, delivering on what you expect, you can substitute them in with uh, another consultant. So um, for businesses, um, that's the flexibility um, that I think a lot would appreciate. And it's something that we thought um, we really liked about um, the structure. So uh, yes, uh, there's an element of, um, you know, you're trying to find a partner, you're in it for the long term, but at the same time, you do have the flexibility to get out. Mel, thanks for joining me again uh, in this series. Now, we are talking about step six in the change management process for advisors when they're running through uh, and um, any any sort of major implementation, including managed accounts into their business. Now, one of the, the steps here at step six, we talk about uh, leaning into the concept of there's always going to be some sort of what ifs, objections. Um, yeah, but what about this? I've got this thing in my back of my brain where it says, I you know, I have to do this or I have to do that. Um Often, sometimes those things are limiting beliefs and they're not actually that true. But uh, what, what have you seen around the space that you know, where you get these sort of things holding people back? Yeah, this is a great step. And when I first started working in the industry and we first started projects around managed accounts, we actually didn't address this. It was only in the last few years that we really lent in heavy into this space because it was actually a real hurdle in the adoption. Um, and people often didn't want to talk about their objections. So, changing that narrative and being really um, on the front foot with them saying, you know, these are some of the objections that we get. You know, let's normalize that there are objections here and address them. And we used to do workshops with clients, you know, around working through them. So, it's not just there's there'll be objections from all levels within the business. Plus, what about the clients? What if the clients object? This is still a new value proposition that you've got to put in front of your clients. So I think, you know, it's reasonable that you should play out what what could their objections be? Make sure you've got answers for it. And that yep. process is actually really good as well because by doing this with someone, you end up building really strong beliefs yourself around these ideas. Yeah, I think um, I think as you're talking, then I'm thinking that you definitely need to create that safe space, right? That that right now we're just talking about this particular step. We're just talking about like what are all of the issues that people have with this? What's the pain? What are the perceived pains? Because often mm. if we, if you say to somebody, "What's the perceived pain that somebody else might feel?" and then you get the pain that they're feeling, right? It's easier to say, "Oh, somebody else might think that there is an issue with oh, what a." What if they? What if it costs more for the you know to provide the service, or what yep. if it you know? And but that's the actual thing that they're thinking about, but they just want to say it as in a way. But I, I guess that safe space is is an important. I think it's really important, um, and you know, to your point, perceived beliefs as well. So, will my client now think, well, you used to do all that. What are you doing now? Or you know, my client actually wants to make all the investment decisions. So for the client, but then also the advisor, you know, I've picked these portfolios for the last 10 years. I've made these portfolios, you know, I'm now introducing someone else. Isn't that my job? And what does that mean for my personal value proposition? So I think it's definitely something that you need to create a safe space about, but it is 
a vital step for this adoption in managed accounts. And the other thing I would say is that the players in this space in our industry are so good at helping and facilitating this step. And they've been doing it. They've been working with, you know, national practices. And I'd, I'd really be keen to see advisors leaning in more to people in our industry, giving anyone a call, giving me, link, hit people up on LinkedIn. What do you think? How did you do this? Share the knowledge. Yeah, getting getting over that uh, getting over that belief or that objection or that idea, and yep. and that was a really interesting one that you mentioned here. Like, if if I was doing that in the past, and and uh, now I'm outsourcing that, that does that devalue me? And that's a really interesting thing for yeah. people to get their wrap their heads around. Absolutely, but that's your that's how you're going to have to present this to the client. And you've got to do that. You've got to believe you. You know, advisors get to the point that they're or firms they're implementing a managed account because they fundamentally believe that this is the right thing for your client base. And but why do you think that you know changes in technology and and access to these managers is now available? If that was available ten years ago, maybe we would have been doing it then. But it's only just available now. But these kind of conversations are really good for the practices and firms to be having before sitting in front of your clients because you are only doing this because you believe it's the best thing for your client. But you're on the back foot a little bit. It's new. It's a bit scary. It's like it's fine. Pitch practice together. Yeah, exactly right. The old pra- yeah, practice together. Yeah, yeah. Everyone, everyone loves a good role play, but um, <laughs> uh, which we'll get to in a minute. But uh, but I do I do think this is a really an essential step, right? It's a really important part of of you yep. know getting all those things out, uh, understanding what the objections are, uh, understanding what if they're perceived or real, understanding what the truth is around those. Like maybe that was there was actually a lot of evidence to be of, of the contrary or whatever it might be, and understanding other people's stories and being able to have that that. Um, comfort and security and confidence to be able to move past this going, yep, it doesn't matter what people throw at me now, I've got a good answer for it. Yes. And it's, again, your beliefs. So as you just have to, as long as you're believing it and saying it, that's fine. But yeah, it's forming your beliefs and working through the detail. It's a new, it's a new offer. So spend the time working through the detail. Yep. Brilliant. That's it. Step six, uh, overcoming objections. Don't skip that step. No. Tom, in step six of the change management process, we are thinking about some of the objections that were uh, often come up in in adopting managed accounts. What have you seen in the space? Many, many objections. It's a pretty daunting um, process when you're starting from the beginning. So there's many objections that advisors have. Uh, I think the first one and often the largest one is control. Uh, and advisors not wanting to give up control of the investment decision-making process. In the end, we say advisors are not giving up the ultimate control. Their job to sit there is to govern the process, to design the mandate, and to ensure its ongoing suitability for their client base. So ultimately, the, they are in control. It's just that in, off, in, in cases, particularly such as working with us, um, you are delegating day-to-day decision-making within those mandates. And and once they understand that they can still deliver the perception of control to their clients, then then ultimately um, that's all they're really looking for and, and it's liberating to actually to, to let go. Fantastic. Now, uh, apart from control, because I want to get to control sort of in the next step, uh, what about uh, what about the idea um, around fees and, you know, thinking that uh, there, are, there are more layers of fees now to be included? I think the value chain has, has evolved. That's probably one thing. So we know platform fees have come down a long way. There's obviously been pressure on advice fees, but there's also pressure on investment management fees. We're seeing you know, the fees for the underlying funds in the portfolios come down and, and actually – you know, through managed accounts, we're able to deliver scale advantages. So you know, the aggregate fund that we manage as a business um, enables us to negotiate uh, cheaper fees or institutional pricing for our clients, which are you know paid through to the end client in the form of a rebate. And we're actually seeing you know that percentage of the portfolio largely offset you know the investment management costs that we layer in there. And so what in most instances with our clients the total cost of the managed account portfolio is often less than the portfolio, the fully advised sort of um, portfolio that they're coming from. So the perception that it's more expensive is is generally not true. It's often cheaper, which is, again, an additional benefit for the client. Yeah, again, I I love it when we come to objections because there's we we sort of have these these 
um, you know, limiting beliefs in our brain that go, that must be that that must be the thing that I've I've held on to for all this time. And then, uh, and then when somebody does the numbers and you and you come up and you go, oh, well, okay, that's a, I, n- I need to rethink the way I'm thinking. Um, look, I want to also lean into the concept of the regulators and and the um, the concept around um, whether it can be seen as a product or can be seen as a service. And there's obviously lots of different things around um, with the regulators and and and. Where, where it sits in the space. Have you seen that as an objection? It's certainly an objection, uh, but I actually turn that on its head. I think that really practices should be considering you know, what the regulator would ask about the way in which they're currently delivering investment solutions to their clients. Like, is it really in the client's best interest to have a quite static, you know, portfolio that's only rebalanced at the time at which the advisor, you know, meets with the client. Uh, is that really been the best interest? And then secondly, around equitable execution. So how, how is it, you know, there's, it's under the code of ethics now, the equitable execution, but how do you make a change within your client base? Do you start with your highest fee paying client or your lowest fee paying client? And so creating efficient structures to deliver, you know, the same price, at the same time to all of your clients is really the, the only way in which I think you could be doing the, you know, meeting your, um, you know, your ethical obligations. Uh, and so I'm sure there's some, there's certainly objections that ask will question the amount of work that you are putting into the investment process, but I don't think that's true at all. I think, in fact, you're doing more, there's more reporting, there's more insights. Um, the governance role that you have as an advisor and, um, in designing and overseeing the, the total process still absolutely exists um, and you're just delivering it in a much more equitable and efficient way for all of your clients. So I would ask people to turn it on and and think about what they're doing right now and whether the regulator would think that's, that's a good thing. Yes, exactly right. That, that uh, everything that somebody's doing right now could uh, be picked on in some particular way. That's, uh, right. that, that's the uh, that's the the environment we're living in. Talk to us a little bit about um, what you think some people might be worried about, whether they um, uh, are locked into a structure or, or can't change once they start this process. Oh, look, one of the one of the many benefits of a managed account is the fact that the underlying assets are held in the client's name, mm-hmm. and so. I would say no, no one's locked in a structure. A client, an individual client can walk off with the portfolio as it is today and sort of unlock themselves from the, from the model portfolio that attracts at any time. And so, you know, they're liquid, they're transparent and they're in the end investor's name. So there's not, you know, it's not a closed end fund by any means. I think that's, that's really important. Um, certainly as a business, there's a commitment around what you're doing um, and but you can absolutely change all of your partners and I think the way that, back to that sort of value chain consideration, um, adopting specialists within the value chain to help deliver the service for you means that that is interchangeable. you know don't if you've got an independent responsible entity or managed account operator, um, sitting across an investment manager and a different platform. Um, there's there's various specialised parties in the process. If you're buying, you know, your investment management, your you know your regulation, etc., or platform all from the same place, I would ask questions because that that looks a little bit too locked up for me. But if you're buying specialised services from across the market um, as part of that, it's easy to interchange them over time. Yep. Thank you. And I guess the, probably the last objection that people have come up with is just around the concept of um, this, just so many ch- decisions to make, so many choices, um, where to start, you know, who, who to who to look to. Um, you, there's just some, it's, it's quite an overwhelming uh, thing to start the process, which is, I guess, which is what we, we've created this change management process piece to start with. But what are your thoughts around it being very overwhelming? Certainly there's a lot to consider. And so I think, understanding that there's multiple parties that are involved in this process and it has been done before. If you're starting out on the journey today, um, looking at providers that have actually demonstrated the ability to deliver all of that for you over, you know, in the end and get to that sort of north of 80% conversion within clients, I think is really important. Um, Looking for the resources that are available within your service providers, whether that's investment manager, asset consultant, whether that's within the platform, but you, you need support teams as a advice business that you can leverage uh, and, and having someone there with a dedicated sort of, you know, operational or practice management um, support that, you know, that's going to assist you to, to go on the journey because there's lots of different ways to tackle the project uh, and often, again, the advice practice needs to make sure that they're able to implement this without, you know, disrupting their ongoing advice activities. 
Yes, and I think the, 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 the thing about being overwhelmed is it stops you from making decisions, and uh, this, this one certainly requires a lot of decisions to be made. So, uh, Tom, thanks so much for catching up in this step. We look forward to chatting to you when we start talking about uh, the next step, which is letting go of control. Mm-hmm.